For centuries, German immigrants have ventured to American shores for the same reasons as so many others, to pursue new lives in a land of opportunity and to forge brighter futures for themselves, for themselves and their families. These immigrants and their descendants have changed the course of our history and paved our country's path of progress. And on German American Day, today, we recognize their role in building a stronger and more prosperous nation for all our people. Happy German American Day, everybody, and welcome to this event. It is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Cultural Vistas and the Robert Bosch Foundation and the Robert Bosch Foundation Alumni Association to What Now? New Perspectives on Brexit and Transatlantic Relations. Before we begin, I'd like to extend our thanks to the Robert Bosch Foundation Alumni Association for organizing this event and reaching out to all of you, our distinguished guests. And for those of you, uh, how many of you know about the Robert Bosch Foundation Fellowship Program? A wonderful year, excellent. How many Boschies are in the room? If there's any, excellent, excellent. I am, I, who, anybody uh, older than Bosch four? No, I am the oldest Boshi in the room. <laughs> and the youngest is Bosch 30. We have a Bosch 31. Bosch 31. If there is anybody interested in learning about the Robert Bosch Foundation Fellowship Program, there are a number of us who have had experiences over the last 30 years who would be happy to tell you. And one of our colleagues from Cultural Vistas, who is somewhere, has materials. Uh, Downstairs. So anyway, there is there is materials. Um, there is also an information session on October 13th here if you want to learn more. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate and introduce this conversation. I'm Nancy Walker. As I said, Bosch 4. Bosch 4 was 1987 to 88. The Cold War was very cold. The Berlin Wall was very solid. And the most exciting thing to happen was when Eric Honecker came to Bonn in his helicopter. Um, that was, the world changed a lot since uh, my days in, in Bonn, when Bonn was still the capital. Um, we have our expert tonight is Dr. Constanze Stelzenmuller, who it turns out has a number of relatives in Mobile, Alabama. I just learned part of the German-American immigration story. <laughs> she is our expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign and security policy. She is the inaugural Robert Bosch Senior Scott Senior Fellow on the center, um, at the Center of the United States and Europe at Brookings Institution. Prior to Brookings, she was the Senior Transatlantic Fellow with the German Marshall Fund and also directed the Transatlantic Trends Survey Program. She works on transatlantic relations, German foreign policy, NATO, the European Union foreign security and defense policy, international law and human rights. She is a lawyer, a writer, really smart, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time telling you about her bio. Needless to say, we are very lucky that Constanza has agreed to spend some time with us this evening. So our format, we have an hour and Everybody needs to make me literally run downstairs at 7.55 to get my car out of the parking lot. And if anybody else parked downstairs, you need to get your car out of the parking lot at 8 o'clock or they will lock the doors. But I digress. We are talking about Brexit. Um, and in honor of the occasion, I wore my scarf from the Royal Ballet in London just to celebrate not only German American Day, but the ties that the United States and Great Britain also have. Constance is gonna to talk to us about Brexit. Let's start with some questions. We're gonna have a conversation and then we'll open up the floor to you. When you ask a question, please stand, wait for the microphone, introduce yourself and ask a question. Please don't give a speech. Constance, let's start. Is Brexit for real? <sighs> oh yeah. Um, I fear it is. Um, I, you know, there was an extended period uh, of doubt about uh, this question. Um, there was a lot of speculation, some of it informed, not all of it, um, that this might all have turned out to be an unpleasant dream and no more than that. And that there were, I mean, a, a variety of alternative scenarios were, were played out in the pages of the Financial Times uh, and, and other worthy publications. Then I believe uh, a week ago, Theresa May um, said that she was going to trigger article 50, which then begins the divorce proceedings, 
in uh, the spring of next year. As we know, Article 50 provides uh, for a two-year period in which the divorce um, papers have to be have to be written, signed, and mailed, and then that's it. Um, so I suppose it's going to happen, and the the all the signs from London are is that uh, there the the divorce negotiation posture from the UK government is going to be hard rather than soft. Um, they are not willing to compromise uh, on uh, freedom of movement, and for that they are willing to forego um, membership of the single market which means then devolving Britain to mere sort of the, the status of a WTO member and Britain having to ne renegotiate commercial treaties with, I don't know, 250 nations. I've, well, maybe perhaps not 250, but anyway, a lot of them. Um, and the conversely, or that has in turn made European governments, in particular that of my own country, Germany, um, take a very hard line as well. So yeah, it's real. It's okay. When who are the what are the downsides other than the trade stuff and who is going to be affected by them? Well, the metaphor that I've used is that this is the equivalent of ripping out a large and sort of quite functional and existential organ from a living organism. Um, a lot of tissue gets hurt. Uh, both in both in the another vivid section is what it's called, I think. Uh, both the, the the organ is substantially impaired, as is the organism from which it is ripped out. Um, I mean, this is metaphoric. The reason I'm being sort of slightly uh, dramatic about this is that because I'm a lawyer, I know that the actual details of this are so fiendishly complicated that I don't want to pretend to you that I know things that I suspect the British government doesn't know yet. Um, so I am using metaphors to describe to you what I think this means. And indeed, I have lawyer friends in England who have written to me in despair and said, um, a friend of mine is a, is a silk, a Queen's counsel, who, um, who is a, a well-known specialist in international property law, and who said, I have no idea how we're going to do this. Half my field is European law. Uh, we have, you know, this is uncharted territory. Okay, two rounds of optimism to start with. Are there any upsides to Brexit for anyone? Um, well, I know there are a couple of people in the in the audience who might have an opinion on this, among other than Nick, Nick Boucher from GMF over there. Um, but um, I find it really hard to see one, frankly. I mean, I, I find the the depiction of uh, both the, the rationale advanced by the Brexiteers um, and the depiction of the world that they believe they will re-enter um, to be something that, I mean, to me, it's sort of post-factual thinking, honestly. I have a, I have a really hard time um, accepting intellectually that this is workable. Um, in particular, I, I think that this is, and I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I, I will admit upfront to you that I'm, I, have, I am not neutral on this. I'm biased. I think that this is a huge mistake. And it's a hugely damaging event for Britain and, and for us. And you will have noticed, it will not have escaped anyone here, that the pound dropped to a five-year low right after Theresa May's announcement. But the, the, the reality, I think, is that the, the, the notion of sovereignty on which the, the Brexiteer case is based is, in today's integrated, globalized Europe, is delusional. You know, there is no such thing as retaking control by opting out of Europe. And I, and I fear, I mean, let, me, let me be sort of uh, insulting one last time. Uh, who I, here I has seen Yes Minister? I insulting. I think that Good. you are offering a strong, well-argued opinion Thank you. with which people are free to disagree. Exactly. I think so who's seen Yes Minister? In... Okay, you have. Yes Minister, a famous TV series in Great Britain in the 1980s. Uh, some of you will know the character of uh, Jim Hacker, the uh, somewhat feckless um, government minister, who is helped along or thwarted, depending on what was necessary, by his perm sec, Sir Humphrey Appleby. And I think that we now see that this was, it, that this was, had nothing to do with satire, but was in fact an extremely accurate dis description of the differences between the political class in England and the civil servant class. Uh, one of whom sort of gives directions in, based on blithe ignorance of the actual complications entailed, and the other ones who sort of, you know, have to actually do stuff. Um, I mean, again, I'm being, I'm being 
slightly facetious for the sake of, you know, it's been a long day, it's evening, and we want to argue. But, um, but I, actually, I actually, on the basis of some personal observation, including once as a journalist having spent two and a half days, no, three, with Boris Johnson, campaigning, uh, in having interviewed him at his house in Islington in London and then spending two days with him in his, his house in, in Wales campaigning. I, I believe I can say on the basis of some observation, personal observation that this is accurate. <laughs> Thank you. Let's come around to the area where you spend a lot of your time researching security policy. Let's talk about Brexit and British security policy and the implications thereof. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the British theory obviously is, you know, we leave, we leave the EU, um, we re-engage with the world of the Commonwealth in which I think the UK sees itself as leader. Um, I'd be interested to hear what the Canadians and others and the Indians and the Pakistanis and others think of that and the Australians. But, um, I mean, obviously the Brits are going to remain members of NATO. Um, but I... I mean, ba based on the vision, on the, on the narrative of Europe that the Brexiteers have propounded in the course of the Brexit campaign, I have a hard time seeing how in a NATO uh, context where the focus has returned on, uh, back to regional deterrence and defense and European resilience, if Europe is as feckless, worthless, and you know, need, you know, and sort of divorce-ready as as the Brexiteers have suggested, I don't understand why they would want to be defending it in NATO. Um, in other words, you know, if this is if I mean, in, in other words, the, the it seems to me that they can have the spatial relationship with about with America without the transmitter belt of NATO. Um, again, I'm being really rude here, and it's too bad there isn't a Brit here to you know to uh, um, really. <laughs> Well, half Brit, right? Um, but I mean, and, and feel free, Nick. But um, the uh, I think actually, having having spent some time looking at at UK and and security policy and and what's happened in terms of defence and security capabilities across Europe, um, it seems to me that the Brits have been very energetically and in some ways cleverly. Uh, specializing in ways that become problematic uh, when you divorce that from its larger European context. And I would say that the Brits have done what IBM did uh, a decade ago, which is to say, all right, you know, the hardware ain't working so well for us. We're going to go into software. Um, because it is very difficult for even a major European power these days to afford the hardware that goes with full spectrum forces. Aircraft carriers are expensive as are armored cars, et cetera, et cetera. So what they have done, it seems to me, is invested hell for leather in intelligence capabilities and everything that comes with that. And in step-by-step step divesting of the kind of hard power that you would need if you, say, were looking more at territorial defenses or at certain kinds of expeditionary warfare. And so, again, I have a, I have a hard time seeing how, th how that particularly given how upset Washington is with the UK for doing this, how, how then they redefine their security posture both within Europe and, and globally. And if you then add to that equation an America that is openly thinking about the value of its alliances, the value of its engagement in Europe, and whether the Europeans shouldn't pony up, and even if they do pony up, well, you know, we'll get the hell out of there because frankly, you know, it's costing too much and what, what's it getting us? Um, you know, to paraphrase the line of one of the candidates, um, then this could, this is a situation which I think in the worst case could leave the Brits badly exposed. Thank you. And what about, no, no apologies. This is, this is why we've asked you here. And I am counting on everyone in the audience to be thinking of good and important and challenging questions because this is what we're up against. This is the real world we're talking about. On German American Day, let's talk about Brexit implications for Germany. Well, um, those have already become um, somewhat visible um, to anybody who watches this space, as I presume some of you do. Um, in fact, I think the Obama administration decided a while ago um, well before Brexit, that the Germans were the go-to phone number in Europe for one reason or another. 
Um, you, some of you will remember the reluctant hegemon cover in The Economist a couple of years ago. Um, there is this perception, true or false. Um, uh, certainly it's accompanied by a lot of expectations which one would call unrealistic. But there is a sense that, at least for me, having lived here now for two years, that Washington sees Germany as the equivalent of what America is in NATO. In other words, the prime among equals, the go-to power. If you get the Germans to do something, everybody else will fall into line. My answer to that and Berlin's answer to that is, yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but the, yeah, the, the, the reality is actually that there is uh, there is has been some movement in Germany uh, to reciprocate, um, not I think in immediate response to American expectations, but because I think in fact because of the realization that there is a very real camp here that advocates a, a uh, minimizing or, or withdrawal from uh, European and other entanglements by, by America, and that this could leave Europe and and with it Germany exposed in ways that you know given the current. Uh, meddling in the European space by the Kremlin, uh, ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine, and of course everything that's going on around the uh, the, the Mediterranean and the migration crisis, that could, um, which all of which have increased security tensions and social tensions in Europe, could again leave Germany and its neighbors and allies badly exposed. What should Chancellor Merkel be doing um, that she's not doing now? <sighs> Yeah. And what should she avoid? <laughs> All right. Um, I think that she generally. I've. I've. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm. I'm grinning a little bit because I'm. I uh, unfortunately I'm on record uh, in 2005 with with an FT editorial, no less, an op-ed. Sorry, um, uh, predicting that Merkel would not last longer than two years, and I think. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think it had the title Dead Woman Walking, um, which was quoted from the text, which may be one of the reasons why Christoph Hoiskin doesn't like talking to me. But um, uh, so I have, I have repented of this analysis um, and not just you know, for opportunistic reasons, not that I wouldn't have those, but I, I actually I mean, I'm willing to admit that I was wrong. Um, in fact, facts prove that I was wrong, right? Um, but I do think that, and, and in general, I, I, I find many of the things that she's done admirable, particularly um, her decision on September 4th last, 4th last year to let in the refugees. Um, but I often have what the English would call issues um, with her style. Um, and this both, both her style of communication and her style of management. I think that um, this, I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that this cautious incrementalism of hers is a very sort of, you know, very much in tune with German cultural sort of approaches to things, you know, as as a, a, a there was a, a social democratic chancellor candidate who's deservedly forgotten, um, Volker, my God, God, the minister president, no, no, minister president of Rhein and Pfalz, um, Beck, thank you, Beck, there you go, and Beck, Beck, who who used to say, immer, immer langsam mit die Leute. Yeah? You have to take people along with you slowly. And I appreciate that. But I think that currently uh, she and her government are being punished for not having thought far enough ahead and for not having planned far enough ahead. And so much of what we have been seeing, particularly in the last year in the response to the refugee crisis, is them scrambling madly to, to catch up and to, as it were, batten the hatches against further sort of critical developments on, on a broad variety of fronts. I mean, I do, I do think, for example, keeping together the sanctions con consensus has been huge, not just in, in sending signals, signals of determination and resilience to Russia, which were key, I think, in making Russia retreat in some ways from, from a more adventurous posture. Um, uh, I think that's amazing, and that by German standards is really leaning forward very far. Um, but I do think that it took them far too long to not just to respond energetically and organizationally to the refugee crisis, but to, to acknowledge that people were feeling overwhelmed despite the enormous outpouring by civil society of help and that that fear was going to have to be addressed. You know, and she's, I mean, this is something she's notoriously not good at, this kind of messaging. And some of you will have noticed that at the end of the summer, she, she did this trip around Europe um, you know, which was very much a sort of public message of I have come to listen to you because clearly I haven't done enough of that. And I looked at this and said, yeah, great idea, but you know, you should have been doing that, for, you know, 
you should have started doing that four years ago and you every year since. So that frustrates me. Didn't she get a lot of, um, didn't she get an earful from her European counterparts about the Brexit follow on in this well, listening oh tour? God. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there was one particularly unfortunate episode where the foreign ministers of the six, the six founding countries of the EU, um, you know, that Brexit was on a, uh, the Brexit numbers came out on a Friday morning, on a Saturday morning, the foreign ministers met in Berlin uh, to announce uh, sort of proposals for deeper integration. I have to say, I nearly blew a gasket. Um, I, I was in Berlin at the time, and I thought this was, while I'm actually, I have a pragmatic take on deeper integration, I am I'm, I'm not against these proposals. And in fact, to the extent that they reassure people that Europe is willing and able to take care of some of its security problems on its own without always having to free ride on American capabilities, I think that is a good thing. It's certainly not anti-American or anti-NATO. It's again, it's pragmatic, but you didn't have to do it this way on the day after Brexit. That sent all the wrong messages and, oh God, I was just, I mean, I was chewing the carpet. And let's talk about Europe and Brexit. You've talked about Germany, you've talked mm. a bit. What about other European countries? What about the EU as an institution? Well, I mean, I think it's recognized by most of us, you know, and, and, and I actually think that the, you know, the old sort of French style super federalist, yeah, who wanted to uh, have the EU as a counterweight to the US um, and, and, and thought of the US as a hyper pouvoir, you know, too powerful for its own good and the world's good. Um, I think that that species is has practically disappeared. Um, what we're, I think, many of us are filled with regret because the Brits bought enormous intellectual and policy making and security capability to the table, plus an, a liberal attitude to trade, a liberal interventionist attitude to security issues, which I, as a sort of liberalish, you know, hawkish sort of person very much appreciated, um, and a generally sort of pragmatic attitude to resolving policy problems, you know, not as theoretical and sort of incremental as the, you know, your standard German issue approach. And, and so the, the specter of losing that, um, to me, is, is horrifying. Plus, you know, a tradition of civility, of, you know, hard-nosed pragmatism. Although I have to say that what's been coming out in the last day or two uh, from what is it, the Blackpool conference, it's the Tory, Tory leadership conference in Blackpool, I find has been, I, I, I don't, you know, and I, I actually, as you will probably hear, spent part of my childhood in London. I mean, my hair is standing on end. Yeah, this, this whole- Tell, every, tell people who I'm are sorry, not yes, familiar I'm sorry, I will, uh, let me just, uh, I think the quote was, this is a speech by Theresa May and then by what her Secretary of Labor, Amber Rudd, said it, um, saying that making a distinction between people who were born in Britain and there, thereby, con, you know, by their work were contributing to its greatness. Whereas people who weren't born there and therefore by implication not contributing to its greatness. And the second implication was that these people's, you know, days in Britain were ultimately going to be finite because it was not desirable for them to remain there forever because clearly they were taking jobs that were due to Brits. I mean, to me, that's hair raising. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've I've heard a sort of numbers hair of being raised on both sides of the Atlantic on similar statements. Absolutely, but it but yeah, it's a it is part of a yeah. a trend, a, a sad and scary trend. Of course, but but the but the I mean, there are a number of British expats in Germany, and I, I, I mean, there are all these stories about the Brits getting German passports, you know, and and I'm um, sorry. Yeah. I, you know, there are moments when I think maybe we ought to be more selective, but I, I'm not going to blame. <laughs> I'm I'm not going to blame Nigel Farage's daughter for her dad. I'm gonna I'm gonna give her the benefit of the doubt, but I did hear that story. Yeah, and, and claim her as a proud European citizen, um, perhaps. Wife is German. Pardon me. His yeah. Wife is German. So, um, well, we've talked about implications of Brexit for Britain, for Germany, for Europe, and what about the Commonwealth? Well, I think I we mean, forget in talking yeah. about. Sure. I mean, the, the question is, I, I, this is something that I know less about, but I, I sort of genuinely wonder um, how much value and how much commonality um, there is to the notion of the Commonwealth in, in today's world. I mean, this sort of reminds me of what the French, you know, the French kept going on about the Francophonie at the United Nations and this idea that they could sort of array all the Francophone nations 
um, in uh, in uh, general assembly votes uh, for anymore, because the glory of the French the, the glory of the French language unites one around the French flag. I don't think so. <laughs> um, and, and it's been a long, suspect, long time yeah, since that. Was... Exactly, and I similarly suspect that the nations of the Commonwealth will look at the Brits and say, "Really, what are you bringing to the table, and what are your specific plans?" Yeah. So. I don't know, contradict me, please. But. No, we can, I, I welcome questions on that. Um, do you think there's going to be a second referendum? Is there any chance? I don't, unless, unless there is a real, I mean, absent an external shock yeah, that justifies that. I think that um, the Tories would completely up, yeah, I mean, just, just completely discredit themselves with that kind of course. I think Theresa May has done something a lot more clever, which is to put the chief exiteers in positions of responsibility for, for negotiating Brexit, in which I would expect them to fail quite miserably, um, unless, of course, helped by their respective Sir Humphrey Applebee's. But, but indications so far have been that they, um, I mean, this is, I'm just going to continue being rude here. Um, I, I, I get the, having, having seen the people like Liam Fox at international conferences, I do not get the impression that Liam Fox is going to be likely to appreciate the subtlety of the workings of the minds of his civil servants. And indications of, indications. The daughter of a diplomat. Yeah, and, 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 and indications from Washington, as, as reported in the Financial Times and elsewhere, is that some of, some of the Davis's, Fox's, and Johnson's interlocutors have been sort of, how should I say, slightly um, surprised at the, at the degree or the lack of knowledge um, implicit in, in some of the advances made by the Brexiteers. I mean, you know, you've... Rumor is that Frank Walter Steinmeier can't bear to be in the same room as Boris Johnson, and you remember the 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 Schäuble, you know, the Schäuble's remarks um, saying that you know we financial we financial ministers are used to respecting foreign ministers. <laughs> I mean, Schäuble can be quite rough as it is, um, but usually that's obscured by the fact that you have no idea what he's saying unless you actually speak German. But that was helpfully translated by the international press. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Before we open the floor to questions, I have, uh, there's a wonderful article by the BBC News that came out on the 2nd of October, and it says, all you need to know about the UK leaving the EU, and it really is a wonderful from soup to nuts. And it also includes questions that were submitted by readers and viewers. And one of the questions submitted was, um, will the UK still be able to participate in the Eurovision Song Contest? <laughs> Finally, a really important question. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm going to say if Israel can participate in the Eurovision Song Contest, it'll be a bit hard. But, but it's a beautiful thought. <laughs> Maybe that. we can make that part of the negotiations. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. The floor is yours for questions. As I said before, stand up and give me your name. Wait for, um, I think we're going to share microphones at this point. Quite all right. We'll just pass, pass back and forth. So um, who's got the first question? No bashfulness, please. Um, hi, my name is Inger uh, Easton. I'm from the Netherlands originally. So I'm glad I wasn't rude to the Netherlands. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the big thing was about immigration. Yeah. Um, how is this going to affect? Are there any law changes going to be happening, or are they still tied to the same agreements as before? Well, I, it seems to me that the German government has been somewhat cleverly, while refusing to budge a centimeter on principle, has been de facto putting into place a lot of policies which have reduced the inf inflow of immigrants to a trickle. Yeah. A key part of that was the agreement with Turkey, which is volatile for all the obvious reasons um, and is you know, not something that you can bet a lot on, but, but for the moment seems to be holding because the Turks also have interests in it. Yeah. Um, and there is some reciprocity there, but um, it's not you know, it is by no means to be excluded 
that you couldn't have shocks in the region, in the Middle East, in Syria or in Northern Africa, or indeed Sub-Saharan Africa, that wouldn't, again, increase the pressure you know, and sort of turn on the tap, as it were. Um, and the second issue is, of course, that while the latest um, statistics on the actual numbers who came last year show that this was rather less than a million, in other words, it wasn't a million one hundred as once reported, but I think eight hundred thousand or something, of whom I think forty fifty percent are expected to be sent home because they don't fulfill the criteria for asylum if if I have the numbers accurately in my head um, then you would have then the 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 problem of inter integrating those that remain is is still non trivial yeah? it's still a, a real issue, and and I am not going to deny the the uh, in principle the risk that there might be some attempt uh, by terrorist networks to use the the social tensions, frictions, confusion created in that kind of situation um, for their own purposes. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not going to give you the happy clappy version of this. I think this is going to take long and be difficult. But I, I was thinking of all those people that are in Calais. They're waiting to get into yeah. Britain. So what is Britain going to change its laws or what's going to happen? That that I honestly doubt. But I'm, I mean, frankly, I'm less well informed about that. Maybe somebody else is. But I, I have, I mean, currently the mood in Britain seems to be such uh, that any government that uh, contemplates liberalizing immigration rules, particularly for, for immigrants from the Muslim world who are impoverished and traumatized, um, I think would be risking its own its own tenure. Um, again, you know, if anybody can contradict me, I'd be happy. But it doesn't look like that. And given you know, given the speeches that I've just quoted from the leadership conference, um, I, I I don't you know I don't think there's any bandwidth for that. It's very very sad. But my understanding is anyway that the that the refugees based in Calais are supposed to be distributed in France. Right. So there you go. Not that they want that. I mean, that's a different matter. Yeah. Please, in the back with the tie and the jacket, and then the tie and no jacket. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Jan. I'm uh, with uh, the German Embassy, but I'm not in any official capacity or speaking on behalf. Now you of tell us. Anyway. <laughs> no, so my question <laughs> would just be, you hear a number of times that um, if there's any EU country that could turn an exit into success for themselves would be the Brits. Yeah. So how would you assess, um, let's say, the, the chance or the prospects of other countries following suit, um, if well, let's mean, say in the medium term they yeah. you know, manage. But I think that's the reason why Berlin and other European capitals are taking such a hard line on this, yeah? which is that um, you know, they're, they're terrified of contagion. Yeah? I also, I mean, I'm honestly not sure that the British calculus, economically and politically, um, for turning this into a success is valid. I really don't. I mean, I think it has um, horrific implications for the city, which I don't think they thought through. Um, and I mean, I've been in a number of conversations now where I've heard, you know, senior economists say, you know, I've done free trade negotiations, you know, for, for a number of years at the World Bank. I know just how fiendishly difficult this is. And the Brits are going to do, have to do several hundred, hundreds of these. And they don't know what's going to hit them. Yeah. And, and, and there, I mean, separate from that is, is the incredibly thorny question of the future of the city and financial services. You know, and by, by, I mean, indications are, and again, I'm not a specialist on this, but from what I read, my impression is that uh, facts are already being created and, and firms are relocating their, their employees to the continent. Yeah, so, and Ireland, yeah. Uh, Jonathan Daniel, I'm a former Bosch fellow. Uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, 28, so five years ago. Uh, first question is, uh, do you think that the Brexit will actually lead Sorry. to the dissolution of the UK and what implications would that have for the for Europe as a whole second part of the question is with the UK now seemingly out of Europe or the EU and having played such an important uh, devil's advocate role for the in, in, in the EU for many of the reasons you listed will there be any other country that will sort of step up and fulfill a similar role maybe Poland or a re-entered Scotland so sorry the first question again uh, do you think that Brexit will lead to the dissolution of the UK? Of the UK? Um, I, I think my answer to that right now is it depends. I mean, I think that um, given, you know, with a low oil price, again, I mean, there's other who can contradict me, 
But I think a low oil price, um, and I, I mean, it's just hit $50 a barrel again, but remember, we once had nearly 100. Uh, with a low oil price is a disincentive for Scotland to leave, yeah? um, because that's the major asset that they bring to the table. Um, and they haven't got the kind of you know sovereign wealth fund that Norway has. I mean, not being sovereign, I mean, it's just you know, it's. They, I don't think they have the kind of leverage. Um, and I think you know, for any, I, I don't see Wales leaving. Uh, so I mean, what I, but you know, but this this does raise a sort of a more fundamental question, which which is which is this, that I've, and and I'm I'm not I am certainly not the only one to to who would argue this that a lot of the animosity. Uh, and aggression that Brits express towards the EU as having changed, you know, changed their life beyond recognition, I would say is equally legitimately directed, or even more so, at London, the greater metropolis of London, the London bubble of the super rich you know, and the and the cosmopolitan that is completely disconnected um, from, say, the citizens of of Sunderland, you know, um, which voted massively to leave. In other words, I think there is a devolution problem in the United Kingdom, yeah, and a, a sort of a, a an, an inability and a sort of a centralization of resources and power and and, and, and and governmental attention away from from sort of really um, disadvantaged and disenfranchised communities, post-industrial, post-coal, post-mining. Um, that is a serious problem, and that has contributed to the alienation. That people then, I think, to some degree, have projected on the EU. You know, so this, I think, that some of this is a is a sort of, you know, the political equivalent of a displacement activity. You know, which is not to say, I mean, I want to be very explicit here that I don't think that you can blame the EU for a lot of things. You know, of course, the EU appears remote, preoccupied with itself, bureaucratic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, but I, I, what I, what I, I think I reject is is something that you often hear in London, um, and you know, even from sort of reasonable. British civil servants, which is that, you know, had you only done more you know, to change, had you you gotten that boob job when you are, when we asked you to, you know, we wouldn't have wanted to divorce you. Yes. Um, and, you know, and oh, by the way, and the, and, you know, and while we're on this, and I, I hope you noticed I haven't had wine yet. And while, while you're at it, you know, not only are we still asking you to get the boob job, because, you know, for us to even, and the facelift, um, uh, but because, and, and they're also now, now that the EU is seriously considering, for example, these security and defense proposals that I mentioned earlier, the Brits are blocking, from what I hear. You know? And you have to, and, and, and there I would say, listen, I know you're still members of the EU, but if you really want this not to be an unpleasant divorce, I would suggest that this is not an advis advisable route to go down, because this could actually get quite unpleasant, and you could be on the short end of the stick here. You know, let's, you know, let's not be unnecessarily destructive. So, and your second question was, you know, could there be another, could there be another country that takes the role of Britain? Well, um, I actually don't see that, which is why I personally have, you know, so much regrets um, associated with this development. But what I do see is something that I think is uh, equally dangerous, and that's the sort of the people trying to orchestrate a conservative cultural revolution in the East, namely Mr. Kaczynski of Poland and and Viktor Orban of Hungary. You know? I, I think so far they have tried and failed to um, to turn the Visegrad Four into into the sort of geographic um, locus of opposition for the simple reason that the Czechs uh, and and the Slovaks are saying screw you we're not doing this um, but and the what and the women oh the women oh the, yes the anti exactly the the anti-abortion demonstrations absolutely so I and in other words I think there are there are tensions enough. Over over the course of the EU, but but currently, I think the the ones that I sort of worry about more are the ones that suggest that the European model, as as such, is to quote the Polish Foreign Minister, one that you know um, uh, is is for you know vegan bicyclists, um, you know who celebrate a gay lifestyle, um, whereas you know the the proponents of real manhood, you know Catholic values. And 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 eating meat at all possible occasions, you know, reside in in in, in Warsaw and Budapest. <laughs> this is an actual quote from Bastukowski. It's interesting to, as you were talking about Europe and the EU and Britain, to the have and have nots, and the tradition and non-traditional. 
there are parallels again across the Atlantic. Um, I, we, but we're not going there tonight. <laughs> Please, a question in right here, and then we'll do one, two, and three. Um, Mackenzie Nelson with the Heinrich Paul Foundation. My question relates to exactly to this um, issue of uh, populism spreading to other countries and the parallels between across the Atlantic. And how do the mainstream political parties like the CDU, like the SPD, like the Democratic Party in the US, better communicate the advantages of um, the political elites and of these of these institutions themselves so that people don't lose faith in them how how does Merkel go from wir schaffen das to properly communicating with her constituents yeah. the values of the european union and of democracy it seems well you will have heard that the um, you know the slogan of the counter revolution in germany of the alternative for germany and others is deutschland schafft sich ab right which we could sort of translate loosely as um, and that's certainly that's the intended meaning, she is undoing us. Um, and I think one doesn't properly appreciate the magnitude of the problem if one doesn't admit upfront that um, what the alternative for, for Deutschland has already succeeded in labeling as the establishment parties or the traditional parties um, are on the defensive against this. I mean, none of the, none of the, parties of the German post-war consensus is doing particularly well at resisting this. And the reality is while the AfD has only so far made it into uh, lender parliaments with you know, somewhere between what 10 and 24%, um, and while they have, by all accounts, not done very good at governing where they are actually governing, I mean, or you know, playing a role, say, in making laws, uh, they're of course not governing in the executive. but. Um, where they are doing that, they've so far, you know, not shown any inclination to actually contribute to solving problems. Yeah, and certainly um, in the uh, in the European Parliament, they, like most of the other extremist groups, have been have been noticeable for for absenteeism and collecting, you know, collecting their salaries on time. Um, but the but the reality is is that they've shifted the terms of the national debate, and they've put the, the, the post-war German consensus parties on the defensive in ways that expose their vulnerabilities, expose their failures to communicate, and expose the degree to which they have, I think, become complacent about what I, you know, somewhat hochgestochen, um, somewhat pompously would call, you know, the, the, the um, fraying of the link between representatives and the represented. You know, there is... That's obviously something you see here as well, but it exists in Germany too, and I think it's you know we're uh, we, it's something we have to pay attention to. Hello, uh, Jan Rotenbacher, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Washington DC. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, ask something about Scotland again because. Um, I wonder, uh, you said that the Tories stand somewhere with their back to the wall with their policy and they can't go for a second referendum. But don't you uh, think that's the same for the Scottish National Party in Scotland with this close decision in the first referendum to stay in the UK yeah. and now they lose all the advantage which promoted them to stay in there with losing the EU? Yeah. Um, look, I mean, this this is a shitty situation for the for the SNP. Either way you look at it, frankly, yeah. Um, but but the thing is that it isn't a particularly good course for them to say, "All right, let's have another referendum and ship out," yeah. Because that I I I have a hard time seeing Scotland as a viable entity, in the same way that I think it's a really crap idea for Catalonia uh, to secede. Yeah, you know, it just makes very little sense. Yeah, you know, the 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 sovereign viability of these entities is very much open to doubt. Um, that's not going to stop anybody, but um, but it's you know to the extent that there is um, you know I, I think there are the, the Scots actually have some some fairly good politicians, Nicola Sturgeon being one of them, um, and I think they would think very long and hard about this. Um, it's not pretty for them, yeah, and they're going to have a hard time with this with this Tory leadership. But frankly, I mean, I, I, the other thing. If, I mean, since I'm moaning about the UK, which I mean, just to make it very clear, is in many ways close to my heart. You know, since I spent my some childhood years there and sort of 
thought I sort of knew it, but I have to say, um, and since you're from the Friedrich Hebert Stiftung, the, I mean, don't even get me started on the state of the Labour Party. Yeah? <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn is my idea of an absolute bloody nightmare you know, of, a, of a social democratic party leader. And I would, if you, if you, if you wish to, if, if, you, if you want to have proof of that, I suggest that you read the Guardian editorials of his right-hand man, Seamus Milne, who, if anybody was born with a golden spoon in his mouth, it was him, because he was the daughter of the director general of the BBC. Um, and Seamus Milne is, I think, an unreconstructed sort of Stalinist slash Trotskyite, and, and has a... Yeah, as only in Britain, and with a just you know, it, it's what you would just it, what you could call an off left view of the world. Yeah, and there are many indications that Jeremy Corbyn, while not quite as explicit because he doesn't write graceful op-eds, um, harbors very similar views. You know, in other words, the 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 British political landscape has been captured by people with very hardline, very rigid, unflexible views, which I think are are in many ways sort of divorced from reality as, as perceived on the continent. And let me, let me just sort of add, add one point that, that, I, that I failed to make earlier. I think the, on, on the sovereignty thing, um, you know, this is what my, 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 my British lawyer friend, who by the way is German Jewish on his mother's side and Ghanaian on his dad's, um, was, and what we, he was saying, you know, it's, it's just, I, I, you know, I don't, they clearly don't live in the universe that I live in. You know? And I think it may be that if your, you know, if your family has a county seat you know, and a sort of grade one listed house somewhere, you know, and you've been sending the eldest sons to Eton and the second sons to the military for, for 300 years, you know, that it somehow escapes you that um, the, nation, the nation's actual economic and political success is based on other things. But if you live in, in the middle of the continent like we do, you know, with borders with nine other countries, uh, with smaller neighbors who de facto align their economic and political policies with yours because that kind of bandwagoning makes sense. And in fact, they don't have the bandwidth for doing anything else you know, because it has become too complicated to not do that. Then you have a situation where not only is deep integration a fact of life across the board of most of your, 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 your policies from social to, to defense, but also you are, and I think that's, that's the, the sort of, you know, the key intellectual real, realizations that the Germans have sort of been processing in the last couple of years. You have become responsible for those who are bandwagoning on you because they are dependent on you. Yeah? That's the difference in perception yeah, when you sit in Berlin as opposed to when you sit in London. Yeah? And um, th I mean, that has huge implications. And of course, I mean, the final point is, of course, that Germany's prosperity is existentially dependent on globalization and European integration. It, our, our revenues come from export. Yeah. We keep being told to develop an internal market. You know, that actually isn't working so well. I mean, I certainly think we could do things, you know, spend more on infrastructure. Of course we could. But the, but the reality is, you know, if our export markets tank, if Europe tanks, we tank. Yeah. And then actually you've got a vacuum in the middle of the continent. And that's not great for, for a lot of people, including the Americans. Sorry, that was a slightly longer yeah, round. And it was, yes. In the middle there, please. Hi there, I'm Chris Xarlis. I was a Bosch 20 um, about many years ago. Um, so just wanted to return to, since the, the, they just uh, in, are planning to invoke Article 50 back to the negotiation process and particularly the positions of the sides going into it because like you said it is there is so much devil in the details with what goes on and, and what will come out of it in the end about making this work with a divorce settlement but going into it you know it seems that Britain or you know the Tories while well, there's like the main aspects of the you know regulatory or the you know open uh, borders that they want to um, restrict on. There's still an interest in, in keeping a you know some skin in the game with the you know with the capital markets and with trade. But coming from the other side with Europe um, and their talk about making it difficult for Britain, what's the interest for them to make it difficult for them to? 
continue to have some kind of free trade or capital market arrangement like um, European Free Trade Association or something along those lines? Um, is it just sour grapes or is there, is it trade-offs and horse trading or is there a position there? No, I, th I think the, look, I think the fundamental European position is um, the four freedoms of Europe go together. So the single market and freedom of movement go together. The moment you start divorcing that, you really unravel the European project. Yeah. And, and so what that means is that if the Brits insist on limiting freedom of movement, that means no single market access. That means you revert yeah, because there, I mean, this isn't a sort of, un, you know, a, how do I put this, an open spectrum of options. You, are, you have a menu of options, and the, if, you, if you're not saying single market, um, then, you will, then, then you are reverting to WTO, and that is indeed the position of the British government. Other, other, other menu items are no longer on the table at this point. It was, I mean, it was, went very swiftly the, to the choice between single market and freedom of movement, or no freedom of movement and WTO. That's where we are. Right. Am I right, Nick? Or am I wrong? I guess my only follow-up would be, you know, regardless of whether it's explicitly in the single market, is it in their economic interest necessarily to um, retreat towards like putting up trade barriers with something? Like if the, if it's not explicitly well, in the this EU, is not in their interest. I mean, the, so the Brits why are going to their position because. Uh, they haven't got a choice and um, because they think they can manage it anyway. Um, I mean, it's at this, as I said, the choice is binary. It's either single market access and no tariff barriers, but also freedom of movement because those things go together. That's the hardline European position. There was a, there was a while when uh, some observers thought that maybe the Europeans and Merkel were going to buckle on that. And my sense is that they have decided to not buckle. Um, and the, Certainly the British government appears to think that because they have made it clear that they are no longer seeking single market access. That was ambiguous for a while, but it's no longer ambiguous. And they have said, um, they have now made it very clear as far as I can see, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that what they are going to seek is WTO membership. That means tariff barriers. That means costs for British manufacturing. That means costs for British financial services. Yeah. And they clearly think that they are going to make gains uh, in, in the world markets that will offset those, those costs. Yeah. I, I happen to, th yeah, I mean, again, this, these are in practice fiendishly complicated calculations. Yeah. And really, I, I'm slightly out of my depth here, or maybe more than slightly out of my depth, because I do defense and security and foreign policy. Yeah. And this is, as a lawyer, I have tremendous respect for the intricacies of, of, what, of what this implies. But my understanding is that they have decided to do this, and I think you better ask the Brits why they think this is good. You know how this works out for them. I haven't heard. I mean, I I, I read the FT's Brexit columns. I read Politico's Brexit uh, Brexit emails every damn day, and you. I mean, I will. I I I look very hard for evidence that could make me more cheerful about all this shit. But I've so far I've not been successful in finding any. We have more questions, please, right here. Hi, uh, Margaret Secuda. I'm actually at USTR, so I'm well versed in the whole trade thing. Good. Um, please, help but um, not on the trade subject, and a different subject. Um, like most DC Irish, we're all super concerned about what's happening with Ireland, and we've heard a lot about Scotland, um, but. Also, like most DC Irish, we're kind of like, oh my God, the, it's all starting all up again. So what do you think is going to happen there? And, you know, with Belfast and Dublin so close together and the divide now coming back up, what does that mean for Ireland? Um, again, uh, it's... The thing is, I have heard Irish analysts explaining this, and I, and I cannot replicate the detail the gruesome detail you know, that I have heard them lay out. Um, or, or I think what I'm, the only thing I'm capable of doing sort of with any sort of credibility is to say that it sounded really awful. 
and and like something with few good options. I mean, the Irish are really, really worried, and and with good reason. Now, this is, and 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 again, you know, for the Irish, um, I mean, they're an island away from the continent. Yeah, you know? but the Irish feel, from all that I know, from all I've ever heard, feel completely differently, or, or have a completely different perception about the degree of their integration with Europe you know, than, than, than a lot of the Brits have. It's, it, this may be an, a size and scale issue, you know, that they, I think, realize their dependence in ways that uh, certain members of the British political classes just refuse to acknowledge. And, I mean, again, you know, I, I don't want to give the impression here that anybody in Berlin is dancing jigs, you know, behind closed doors and saying, yay, this assures us, you know, dominance of the continent. Uh, if anything, it makes, um, it makes negotiating consensus on whatever issue in Europe and much more difficult. I mean, there have been, obviously, um, continental politicians, including Germans, saying, hooray, now that the Brits are gone, we can do this, that, and the other. I, I think that that's a fallacy. And so I think the uh, the mood is is really gloomy. I was again I was in Berlin on on Brexit morning and you know ran into a couple of people um, and you know everybody was just completely shell shocked. And I think that's the mood in in Dublin and and elsewhere as well. Any other questions, John? Thank you. I'm John Parisi from Bosch Five, 1988-89. I'd like to come back to free movement. Given the weakness of most of the governments in the European Union, look at Spain, Italy, and the elections that are coming up within the next two years in France and Germany, couldn't you foresee, given the growing anti-immigrant sentiment, that there's a possibility that there would be some buckling and a pathway towards some kind of agreement that would limit free movement? Yes, but not as the price for 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 preventing brexit which i think isn't doable anymore or as the price for the british staying in the single market because they've foreclosed that option themselves i can imagine uh, a sort of darkening of the mood in europe particularly if there are more externalities more shocks in particular um a recrudescence of the sort of immigrant wave um i wouldn't exclude that at all and not least because of increased populist pressures I mean, the afd and others marine le pen and so on would go to town on this but um, but you know as a as a European I would also have to say that would be in contravention the contravention of you know all the all the principles that you know this this union and this project stands for and I would I, I would be bawling my eyes out on the day that that happened yeah and I'd probably be trying to work you know to to roll it back um, I you know I mean to most of us I think it's you know the world of free movement in Europe has been miraculous. And and something that we've all profited on. I, I'm too old for Erasmus, but but all my interns had done Erasmus in one way or the other, and um, yeah, and 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 of course before that it was the interrail pass, um, and and these things, I mean, helped enormously to bring people together. Yeah. So I I come at this from a different angle because I was a journalist before I joined the German Marshall Fund and. Um, and you know, sp spent some time in post-war zones, including in the Balkans. Um, I, I started journalism in the in the mid '90s, um, when a lot of nasty things happened on the periphery of Europe and elsewhere uh, that that Europe, in one way or another, got involved with. I, I wrote about the Balkans, uh, Central Africa, war crimes tribunal, and Afghanistan, and that sort of helps me to connect to the the, the war trauma of my parents' generation. You know, for me, for me, because of my personal experience, the 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 war narrative is is very real. Yeah. I also think that you know, for a German, um, and I, I I'm not, I you know don't, don't want to bet that this is the same thing for people who are twenty years younger than I am, but um, for my generation, the, the the first the creation of the European project after the war. And then reunification, uh, the end of the Soviet Union, and the achievement of Europe, Poland, free mostly, um, was a, a miracle of, of historic proportions and something that we had not reckoned with, that we had not dared to hope for. And
I, I mean, I can only speak for myself when I say I think this is really time to stand up and be counted, yeah, and to protect this because it's a monumental achievement. And I will let me add add one thing. You were asking me where I was today, and I was at the at the National Intelligence Council. They do these global trends games. You know, some of you will have perhaps heard of the global trends reports. This is sort of a strategic forecasting exercise that the National Intelligence Council does with um, public you know, pub public in uh, unclassified information every four years for the new administration that comes in. And very often um, they, exactly. And very often they, 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 they will workshop this with a think tank and academic community or bring them in to do scenario games. And I just spent two days doing that. That's what I've just come from. And um, I can tell you that the three scenarios that we examined were really bleak. Um, I mean, you, you could you could be excused for getting quite depressed by the second day, and quite tired, and thinking, you know, this these scenarios are compelling proof that we cannot afford to let ourselves be um, caught into a sort of downward, mutually reinforcing spiral of disintegration. Because clawing our ways back, our way back to what we have now would be nearly impossible, absent you know another war on the continent. And I and I think that you know from time to time it would be helpful if politicians and other people said this in 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 these words and said you know this is imagine there we actually have and and some of us are alive who have had the experience of it being otherwise. You know, we remember austerity in the 1960s. You know, we remember what it was like to go to Eastern Europe you know, right after the fall of the war, or East Berlin for that matter. And we remember the, the, the poverty and deprivation in which people lived. And we can see how much that has changed. Do we want that back again? I don't think so. You know? So I mean, for, for me personally, you know, I, I, I think that there is a sort of real urgency to this situation. And it's, uh, as Americans would say, not the time to putz around. <laughs> other questions? I have, any other please, don't be, we have time? time for one more. I have, I have the, I, then I will take the, the privilege of the moderator. I have a final question for you. If you had five minutes with the next American president, what would you tell him or her about Britain, Brexit, and the European Union. I think it depends on the president. <laughs> Fair enough. You can... I think, and, and the, one of the options that I can imagine, I'm probably not going to be given that opportunity. Um, but it would be huge. Um, <laughs> that's certainly been experience. But, um, but seriously, I, th I think what, what I would say is, I mean, let's be real here and say, let, let's say it's Hillary. I would say, Hillary, you've said that you will return to Europe and lead from the front. I actually think that it's not going to be that easy for you. Because while there is nothing that Europe wants more than for Europe and America to work together, I think the, the, the sort of paradigm of America leading from the front presupposes a degree of passivity in Europe. Um, that is no longer quite there. You know, there are, I mean, real security concerns in Europe that have focused Europeans in ways on the security dilemmas in their own neighborhood um, that did not exist before. And people have sort of, you know, the, the, the inclination, the good news for you is that the inclination to free ride um, is somewhat reduced here, that people are willing to carry more of the burden. The bad news is that our capabilities are still such that in the case of a really major conflagration, we would be incapable of doing this and we would need you all the same and please don't desert us. But the reality is that most of the problems that we have will not be in a context of major war, but will mean the careful, patient, imaginative, and cautious, in many ways, management um, of conditions rather than the solving of problems. Yeah. And that's a different kind of challenge that presupposes close coordination, enormous personal trust, a lot of communication, and a great deal of sort of interweaving you know, of, of consultation in ways that I think America isn't entirely accustomed to. And I say this because I had State Department friends who a decade ago 
um, would come to Berlin um, with you know lists with checklists and you know which and they would go to the department that they you know where their counterpart counterpart said and said you know points one to seven we would like to see done by you know next week uh, points seven through fourteen maybe you know within the month. Um, I, that's not the way it works anymore because I think now you, I think the key would be to come to arrive at a common understanding of the problems, the problems that can be solved and the conditions that need to be managed. And then you can agree on how to, on how to deal with this. And I think the way that the White House and, uh, and Merkel sort of managed the Ukraine crisis and decided for reasons that you can criticize or not to say, we won't let lethal American weapons be delivered into the theater because we're worried about the, the risk of escalation, despite tremendous opposition within the White House, DOD, state, and Congress, I think is an indication of what this could look like. You know, again, you can criticize that on the outcome, but I think on the actual managing of what was an incredibly tense and difficult situation, it's an indication of what this could look like. What I'm saying, though, is that you will probably have many more cases of this kind of thing going on at the same time. And that, I think, is going to be difficult for America to do, because that's not the kind of, of conversation that it's used to. But I, I would find it, I, I mean, I think it's doable, and I think it would be very regrettable if it didn't happen. Because I think, in the end, it's, I, I think it would help America at home, it would help an American president if that president could say to his or her voters, actually, the Europeans are really trying to pull more of their weight. And this relieves us of the burden in certain significant ways. I mean, I hope this is not wishful thinking. Thank you very much. Um, before I ask you to join me, let me conclude with uh, another part of the proclamation from President Obama on German American Day. And he said, German Americans have throughout our history proven that our diversity is one of our greatest strengths and that no matter where we come from, as Americans, we are united by the ideal that we are all created equal. On this occasion, let us honor the achievements of German Americans by renewing our devotion to beliefs born out of common experience, by creating opportunity that lifts up not just the few, but the many, and by, and by affirming the inherent dig dignity and equality of every human being. I think that's a lovely way to celebrate German American Day. Join me in thanking our distinguished and brilliant guest speaker for a lively and wonderful and insightful conversation this evening. Constanze, thank you, and thanks for the podcast. There is...